So, good afternoon. Here we are, another Woodworking Wisdom. So, a bit of an unusual title, this one, Marking Out. So, we're going to look at basic marking out tools to do with furniture making. So, live session, if you've got any questions, we'd love to have them. We've got Colwyn sitting here doing the questions, Craig doing all the computer bits as well. So, if you've got any questions, even if it relates to stuff we've been doing, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, hopefully, a little bit of freedom this week. So, I dread to think where you could all be watching this. You might be out in the garden with your laptop. You could be stood in the queue for the barber shop or the hairdressers. Um, I know, soon, hopefully, okay? So hopefully this might be relevant. Now, marking out bits. So I did a furniture degree and we've had a couple of questions from people saying, could you do some basic woodworking joints? So I want to start rock bottom, try and help you. Hopefully you'll get a few tips from this. We've got a similar one to follow on tomorrow. So hopefully it'll give you a bit of an idea of what we're looking at what kind of tools we're going to use, how we're going to sort of build on that technique. So we're going to start at rock bottom. And I'm sorry if I offend any of you with doing this, but be nice and I'm hoping you will get a few tips. So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at the marking out tools. That's not really just a ruler and a pencil, okay? They are basic things, but we're going to go a little bit further. So a whole range of different tools I've got. So we've got some gauges. I just need to grab a couple of other things. So I'm going to my box round, get this out. Let's grab a few of these, a few things we're going to want. I'm going to run through these a little bit so you understand what's here. Let's uh, have that. I'm going to flip this around. We want a square and that. So let's put that back out of the way now. Okay. whole range of different things I've grabbed. Most basic thing, really important. So I would go overhead. We have our square, okay? Um, as much as I'm a woodworker, I tend to use what's classed as an engineering square. They tend to be a lot more reliable, a lot more accurate. Some of these, actually, I know, and I've, it's something I questioned a while back. We do a precision square, it says grade B. Does that mean it's seconds? No. The grade A is amazingly precise, over the top for most woodworkers. All right, so in reality, grade B, it's a really good grade, definitely square. These have pins, nice square face, so really reliable tool. Very important for my sort of work box there. All right, I have three or four of those. Different gauges. I've got a whole range of different things in here. So I picked three small ones up. Now, do we know the difference? Now, I'm going to put my glasses on just so we know which ones we've got. So most basic gauge you can have is the one in the middle. This is a marking gauge. This here is, and I've moved the head back. Small pin in here, almost like a nail. You can see the other side that comes through, sharpened up. The head is adjustable. We have a bolt set and we can tighten it up. That's the marking down the grain, parallel to the section. So we have our marking gauge. Mortise gauge has a combination on this one. We have one pin one side, two pins the other. So we have Marking gauge, mortise gauge, the other side. So we can set that up to do our mortises and mark those out. Again, with it having pins, actually it's designed for cutting down the grain section, parallel with the grain. Cutting gauge, very different. Now, again, we've got movable head. We have wedge and block. Now, I want to take these out. This is the little cutting edge. It's almost like a knife. I'm hoping you can see that. Now, a bit of a rounded shape I've got on here. Now, that's deliberately done like something I've done in here. So if you had a cutting gauge, you might find initially it looked more like a diamond shape. Can be worth rounding that off. So when you sharpen it, give it more of a curve on the front face, makes it easier to cut with. All right, so that's purely the reason for that. Next stage, you've got to put it back in here. I want to make sure I have it on the correct side of what I'm cutting. Normally, the top edge will be the flat, the bevel is underneath. I think I can measure from there. So I bring the head back up to get it square, put the wedge back in, I might come up too far, put the wedge back in, get it square against the face, really important. We don't want to position that where it's slightly twisted, it's gonna give you a skew angle, won't cut light like you want it to do, you want to cut it nice and clean. So we need to make sure it's square to the head. So we reposition it, put it back in. Due to the fact I did this yesterday and had a play and it all fell apart, give it a little tap. If there's nothing worse than pushing this onto the piece of wood 
and finding it all falls apart. So we have three really simple gauges there. A bit more modern, come to those. The bigger ones I've got here, bigger example of what we've just shown you. So we have our marking gauge, mortise gauge and marking gauge, so different sizes. Veritas ones have a round wheel, so brass face, they have a cutting knife. Now, the weird thing with this, it can be used as a combination of both cross grain and with the grain. So a bit more dual purpose. The little wheel is actually tungsten. Can they be resharpened? It's going to be one of those questions. You can do the flat very carefully. A little diamond stone, take it off. You could do the flat edge. Again, when you use these, you'll find you can actually drop these down. If I can undo them. Right back inside. So when you're storing it, Lock it back inside so it's nice and safe out the way. The reason I say safe, I do know people have actually cut their fingers using these. So we better have it back out of the way when we don't want to use it. So another version is actually mortise gauge. So it has two bars, two wheels. They're put on different positions, flat on the top, flat on the inside of the other, so you'd actually measure it off your chisel. Not going to need that yet, but want to introduce you to those now because coming weeks we're going to do different joints. So that's mortise gauge. So we're going to put that back out of the way for a second. Move a few of these. So first thing really we've looked at, now what we're trying to aim to do, in reality, join a couple of bits of wood. So I've got a shoulder that I've already cut on this piece. I've done halving joint, been practicing with things, but what I want to give you the relationship to is getting that nice and square as a nice clean joint where everything comes together. Nice and squarely, no miscutting. That's quite an art. Um, and when I looked into doing this, and this was suggested, and a few of the guys said, Jace, could you do some hand cut joints? Oh my God, I haven't done hand cut joints since I went to college. So this is pushing a little bit, getting back into that, which is quite nice to do. Not all of us have lots of machines to do this. So can it be possible to do, you can get better results. Some of you might have time where you want to say, I want to make my own furniture, but I don't actually have the machinery to do this. Or maybe get the joy out of doing it by hand. Some tasks can actually be quicker. So we want to mark up basically something as a joint. And this one's going to be really basic. We're going to do halving joint tomorrow. So I want to do a joint on the end of here, similar, if you like, to my tannin. I might actually lay out two joints and show you, hopefully show you different results. What's going to happen? So our piece of timber we want. I'm going to move our little block out of the vise for a second. I'm going to put oh, something else in the vise. Need to flip this round. So we've already said to you about things need to be set out and marked up accurately before you start. So this scenario thing with this is I want to do something a bit like a tenon on the end. I need to make sure the end of the piece of wood is nice and square. So my square, I get, I hold it up to the light, check we haven't got any gaps. We have a little bit of a gap. So the reason I brought the board up on here, we've got a shooting board set up, so I can gently just shoot the end of the piece of wood. So everything is set up nice and square. I get a much better finish than I can get on a table saw. Get it exactly square on the end. Do the other end so we can mark up each of the joints. So we skim those. That's all I want my plane for now. Now we're just cutting end grain, so hopefully you can see on here getting nice shavings off of this. So we've actually sliced right across that end grain. Nice clean cut. Check their square with the square. There's no point in marking something up if you want on the end, if they're not square. If it's cut out a square and you start marking up with the way we're going to look at, you're not going to get a square joint. So we want a couple of gauges, which we have. We've got options. We're marking up on the end here. So let's put our board back in the vise, which helps you guys see a bit more. I'm going to go that way around my line okay colwyn has got our first question what have we got mate so this is from david he was just asking if it was a 62 plane you used on the shooting board it is a 62 it's a low angle plane 
why use that? It's presentation angle of the blade is actually lower. So it's like a giant block plane. So it's actually more designed for slicing the end grain. So it actually will give us a better finish. Um, I actually like the characteristics of it, especially for a shooting board. It's, I find it easier to hold. A um, few of you are going to kind of say, we haven't got stock at the moment. No, we're desperately trying to get some stock, all right? So they will be back in hopefully soon. But a great plane to use, thicker plane, easier to set up for certain things. So hopefully, yes, it is, all right? So very noticeable there, okay? So we've got a bit of wood. You could kind of look up and say, right, I want a joint of 40 mil off the end, okay? So what happens? The joy of doing this with a ruler and this magic thing called a pencil. Um, is this a marking out tool? Mm, kind of. Um, the reason I say that, if I want this as a marking out tool, I'll do certain things. That's one. That's the other. That's about it with my pencil. I can show face, edge, which way around it wants to go. I'm not going to mark the joint out with it. The normal scenario, we're going to come back more than our 40 mil. We come back 130 mil. Just to give you a line, I've had these people where they go, yeah, I want there, and you scribble six or seven lines moving the pencil back and forwards. You then get your square, and you kind of, which one is it? If you're going to use your ruler, you could use it as a lump stop. Create a line. Initially, I might mark a small dot, draw a line just on the end of the ruler. That's a lot cleaner. You only get one line. You don't get six or seven little scribble bits. So your ruler does have, you know, that's useful because obviously we need a dot mark to tell us where we are on length. But look at how you approach it with something like a pencil. Due to the fact we've squared the ends up on here, I can next use my ruler. We set up our 30 mil. We want to do our scribe. Let me just come back over the middle a little bit. So I'm going to move my board over just to give me a bit of support. The reason for the board I put in the vise makes it easier for you guys to see what's going on. Gives me a platform to sit on so we've got something nice to work on. Our marking gauge we've set up. We've measured it off the ruler nice and carefully. We've got our length. I've got the brass face. I can run press here. Now, it's important how you hold this and push it up against the end. I'm using the wider surface here. If I turn it round, I'm more likely to wobble. So using that platform, come towards me. We cut a line. If we were going to do all the way round, you could mark all the way round, all four faces. So the reason for squaring up with the hand plane first on the shooting board was we want a square end. We can mark all the way round. Now I've marked both ends. We're going to do two different types of joint. On the other marking gauge, so we're going to go small one. Now, I might use my pencil just a tiny bit now, just to give me a guideline as a stop. And by a guideline, I am doing a tiny mark. You probably won't even see it. Very fake pencil line. On the top face, and we're working on where the arrow is, so that's the reason for doing the arrow and the edge. I'm going to do my depth, how much we want to take off. So I'm using the other wheel gauge to come along. One side there. As we said, we're going to do two joints. Just checking the camera. I'm trying to make sure I've not got my head in the way. Check I haven't moved things over. Come to there. So I'm looking at where I'm coming back to. So I'm almost going to do something a bit like a tenon on either end. So at the moment we have... A scribe line. Now, I don't like doing this, but it's going to help you guys see. Highlight with the pencil. So you can see our line we've got in there nicely, just as a depth line. We've got a scribe line that comes across the face. A bit more difficult to see, but there you go. That looks better. Now, how would you approach this bit now? We're going to do mortise and tenons in probably a month's time. The temptation now is you grab your handsaw. And we cut those lines. Now, how many of you would be lovely if we could get you all to put your hands up when we do this and get a vote of, reckon you can cut smack bang on that line 100% cleanly? So we're going to do a vote of the room. You two, what do you reckon? Get your hands around. Do you reckon you manage? Craig's not in. No, no, he hasn't got a chance. Craig, if Craig hasn't got a motor on it, it's no use. Kerwin? 
Now, we're not talking round tenants here now, okay? Right, no. good. So, that's a, a dedicated no from the two boys in the room. Um, ben, if you're watching, it'd be lovely to know what you think. So, we're going to give you that scope. How would we do this bit? Now, let's do that one first, okay? We're going to do the handsaw bit first. So, I've got my line, just trying to see where it is. Hey, it is there. There it is. Just to give me a guide, but... So you can have whatever you like. I'm going to use a number of different saws. So this is small dovetail saw. So I've got my scribe line, which is there. And this is the scenario that most of the guys, when we've done courses, kind of go, I'm going to cut that line. We're there. So nice and gently using my fingertip to stir. Looking at my line. I think it's there somewhere. Not sure now. So I'm pushing down to my depth line. Don't want to go too deep with these because time really check in the other side so i'm cutting what i can see really i'm going to turn it round. I'm going to run down here i'm sorry you might not be in the shot now a little bit to there so i'm looking at this which faces i can see so i turned it round so i can see my line on either side so i don't work more than we could also do a couple of these these are Morton lines or break lines in reality. Nice and gently. One hand with the saw. Other weird thing with the saw. Finger goes down the side here. Trying to keep everything nice and parallel. Your body action is so important with this. Get everything to run fluidly. If you're too far around, you're almost kinking the saw across the front of your body. Doesn't work. Got to give it clearance. Neil, can't quite see. I've got a little bit of line one side, not the other, so I'm not 100% square. That makes it difficult to clean up. So I'm going to do that bit a little bit more in a minute. I'm going to go back to the other end. We've got our line. Then we're going to do something that almost seems forgotten about a little bit now. And if you go through, through the history books, they used to do what's classed as a knife wall. So this one we're now going to look at, what's a knife wall? We're going to explain that in about 30 seconds, hopefully. Right kind of knives, that's an important part. So my favourite knife for doing this sort of thing, Japanese marking knife. Especially nice, long, wide bevel. I like that. That's, that's support, which we'll show you in a minute. Hollow ground on the back. I've sharpened this. It is pretty sharp. Nice, long edge. Fantastic for doing what we're doing now. Stanley knife. No good. Not for this reason. It has a bevel either side. You end up with a V point, not a nice square edge on one side. So that puts both of these out. Can't use them for this. Single V in the middle. That's quite nice. Apart, I find a little bit short for me, but that's just personal thing. You'll see why in a second. So we're going to go back to our Japanese knife. I'm going to use the other magic ingredient for this square. We've got, which you can't see, I doubt, on here on the board, we've got our scribe line right up here. If I move that along, I'm just going to get nearer. Can you hear that little tick? That drops into that scribe line we created with the marking gauge, the cutting gauge. So my knife, I can bring it to there, drop it into that little groove, bring my square. In behind it. So, in reality, the square now is coming up to the back of the knife, the flat edge. Bring it up, lock it in place. So, as long as I've squared the end when we've gone round, this will follow that line. With my knife, not too much pressure. We're cutting across the grain. I lock down with the square. Look at my left hand. Thumb right down this side, clamping in. Nice pressure. I can do this as many times as I want. I can make it a little bit deeper. Now, this is going to seem like you're taking a bit more time, but we now have a very dedicated groove. Back onto the bench. Want to clamp. And again, this is about stopping things moving just to hold it down. We're then going to use something that you all have. Let's go up a size. Wood chisel. 
Now, I just want to bring this back just a tiny little bit. Just do under me that I want a little bit more access. Checking underneath on the vice that I've got something to hold on. So we've got our line on here. I think Craig's got fantastic good, all right? So on chisel, just short of that line, come back about eighth of an inch, three mil. Just going to chisel across. So we've got the bevel upwards, the flat of the chisel on the back. Nice and controlled. That's not bad. First one's done. I want to do it a little bit deeper. So I can use my knife again, slide up to that corner. Put my hand over that clamp would be good. Come along. Now we've got that edge, we're just going to make this deeper. Same again with your chisel. You don't have to go deeper. You might kind of say, that looks enough. Good, my head's not in the way of the camera. That's one of the things I kind of was panicking about with this shot, but that looks good. Same again, just want to clean at the bottom. So I'm using my knife, come up to that groove. So I'm using the back of the knife here when we go in. So now, Craig, can you get the camera? That's the one. Onto there. So I'm using the knife, slide it back up against that face, nice and square, with the square up against it, draw across. Trying to keep the knife nice and accurate this way now. So we're nice and square, pull it across. Now, by having that Japanese knife, I've got lots of action, got lots of position to get my hand in around that joint. I can change the height. Anything too square, too steep, I've got to come up a lot more. So the diamond shaped knife makes it harder to get in there, just from my point of view. And there's less surface contact on this width for this type of marking to get right into that joint. So the long Japanese knife, much easier to pull across. Now, that might seem a lot of work. Does it make a difference? Okay, so let's just have a quick look at what we've got. Doesn't take long when you get into the habit of doing this. Don't know how much we can see on the camera up on here. Let's just go overhead. All right, I'll tilt it around. I've got a nice V groove on the side. Lovely. Okay, that is really nice. So we chiseled down. We've got a nice square shoulder on the left hand side of it. So nice and cleanly cut there. Just brought it over just to give me some room on the other end. I think you can still see that. Let's just slide. I've got an idea. Just worried about where we are for the camera for you. I just want to make sure we can see that's better. All right, I need to just get beyond that end so I've got access to it. Good. So on here, we've got that, that edge. We haven't taken the saw. Now, you might actually even find with this cut, or the depth of how deep you want to go down, you might not even need to take the saw to this. You could use your chisel and then do your mortar and cuts in between. But what's the advantage of doing what we've done there? Do I go even longer saw? I'm going to go Japanese saw. Again, tomorrow we're going to repeat this with the other cuts. But I'm going to show you. The jury we're doing this. I've now got something to drop the saw into. Down into that groove. Got that nice hard shoulder on the left-hand side. So when my hand is here, support the saw. In before I've started, haven't got to worry about squaring anything up. Now, this saw a little bit coarser than we use. Why have I grabbed this? Just to show you that different things will work. Now, I haven't even had to use my left hand to guide the saw. I've got that square shoulder. Makes it beautiful to hold it. So back up to there. That's already created that nice shoulder line. So we can use our Japanese saw, we can do three or four cuts. This is cutting on the pull stroke. Dropping the handle down, trying to make sure we're not going beyond our stride line we put coming down through. We've got three on the, gonna just turn that round a bit deep that way, got carried away so without looking. Cuts too quickly though. Turn around, I've got to get into there. So I'm just looking at where I need to be with a line. Drop them in. Put the sewer out of the way. Yeah, I'm just going to leave them there for a second, but you're going to see more. 
this is about trying to give you a view of what's happening. Then we've got those Morton cuts in between. There's a brake line. What have we got there? 10 mil. That'd be good. So these act as brake lines instead of having one heavy pace. We could actually treat this as a tenon, which means I'd move it around in the vice. It's going to make it difficult for the cameras. I could stand it up. When I plan this out, I try to look at, could we do this in the vice like it is? So next we want our chisel. As we said, 10 mil. I've got my scribe lines on the ends here. I can drop my handle down. I can break this off. Now the bevel is ground on the top. The flat edge of the chisel is down. So we're just chipping those. I can see my scribe line. Why no mallet? Um, this shouldn't need it. This is just about quick bolt removal. I'm not a great one for using mallets with chisels. You damage the handles, you split them. Do we need that much weight behind it? We do the same this end. We're going to give you a view in a minute what we've done. Trying to make sure I'm just short of my scribe line that we put in with the marking cutting gauge down the grain. Using the hand or left hand, the finger and thumb to act as a brake. Stop me going all the way through, coming off the far side, which will break the fibres off. So got that length stop that I'm setting up with my thumb back in here, clamping in. Quick bulk removal. And like I said, tomorrow we're going to do halving joints, so we'll do similar things. So we've taken some of that out. You can see we've broken those fibres off this side. We're going to turn the boards around now so we can do from the other side. So we're coming into there. I can slide this back up. Okay, Colin, how are we done? Yeah, Cliff is just asking which one of the Japanese knives are you using there? Which size are you using? On the chisel or the marking on knife? On the marking knife. There's three or four sizes. Um, I think... And I'd have to have a look and see what you've got. You guys will probably be able to tell me what you've got a size of. There's a really wide one with something like an inch. This one, bear with me, Cole. Let's make it easier. Okay. Let's have a quick look. Try and remember how they label these as well. This is 15 mil across the width there. So 15 mil. Thank okay. you. Perfect. So that's about 15 mil. Nice tool to use. Okay. Look after these. Don't drop them on the floor. My one, when we're done, is back in here in the holder. So it lives back in that groove. We can put them back in there. So just playing in our board now where we've got position. We want to get down on this end is where I'm aiming for. Trying to make sure we're back in the shot. Check where I'm on the vice and underneath because the main vice has got two holes in it and the clamp falls in. So back to that 10 mil chisel. Why go 10 mil chisel? We've got nice 20 mil. We've got bigger. Now the problem with going bigger chisel you try and take more off. What's the problem with that? It relies on you putting more effort in. Smaller chisel will remove more stock. We're not trying to get right down to that, that brake line at the bottom. Going to try that in a minute. Going to test my eyesight with one joint. Going to make it easier on the other. So this is the hand cut joint with the saw cut shoulder. So we have taken most of the bulk out. I can now go to that bigger chisel that I've got. One side done. Got a slide there, and we're going to do the joint that we do with the knife line. So, this has got our V just on the top here where we did that cut with the chisel. So, KN knife line because I'm my view on this should give me a better finish quicker and easier. So, again, we're using 10 mil chisel to take the bulk out. working cross grain why go cross grain because things will splinter off in short sections nice and quickly if we try and come down the grain with this uh, okay we're going to actually split it like an x if you're not careful and it will split down the fibers it won't give you the control we need for this okay so knife line one we've got a bit of work to go we've still got craig i expect if you go to your overhead one there back in there you can just see 
little pencil line I put in to try and see. You can see the line on there. This one, still got our scribe line there. That's good. So it's a tiny little bit to go. It's, it's a minute bit. I'm just going to flip my board over that's in the vice. You'll see the relevance of this board. Maybe it's something you want to build at home because this is beautiful for doing what we're doing. It makes it easier to hold. So we're going to do the one that was freehand saw cut. Bring the clamp back up. Clamping back in. Lure your chisel. Oh my God, I've got to get down there. Now, when I went to college, there was one guy that I worked with. Now I can pull the chisel up, I can drop it into that groove. So this one guy that went to college with me, he could cut anything dead square freehand by eyesight. I hate him. Melbourne, if you're out there, I love you dearly, mate. I hope you're doing all right. So, not as easy as it seems to cut something by eye. Big hand. One side done. Going to turn the bit of wood round. Got to clamp it back in place. Now, the idea of turning the board round that we've got as a holding board the pine block, which acts as a, a break board, if you like, stop me going all the way across, will stop me splintering off the back corner. So again, what we're doing now, trying to drag the chisel up just to find the scribe line, there it is, that we put in with the cutting gauge. Quite a bit of material there, coming up in the middle, I can feel it. going to change we put them away didn't we got a problem with doing this one in here then lots of fibers in the center so where did my saw cut it's a little bit curved in section so i'm just going to put that back in need to slide it along which probably means you guys won't see as much just for a second craig leaves the camera where he is be good for a sec just want to get the square in to make sure i'm not going to come back more now, I could go down with my chisel, but I think my knife will get in there nicely. That's good. Just to sever those fibres. I don't want to split those. Back round. So this is the one that we you do almost freehand, if you like, from start to finish. You could cut it with your saw and try and get your shoulder line nice and square. with the chisel just to clean that back corner out. Our chisel nice and gently using the flat side down on the board, working across. Nice and sharp. Got a little bit of fluff in the corner. I'd need to check we're flat that way. Try hold it up a bit, get you in. So we're flat on there, up, down, through. Have to check we're equal on our scribe line. We've lost our corner mark either side, not too bad. I've got a tiny little bit of fluff right in the corner. So we're doing one, that's freehand. Now, what I don't think is going to be as accurate on here, and I know it's not, I can still see a little line I've got to get along here where I'm not quite back to that. And this is trying to give you the relevance of what's happening. There is a tiny little bit of a knife line, the scribe line on this edge, which we haven't cut yet. So misalign my saw maybe. This end, which has got that knife wall that we created so much better. So, go do the same down this end now. But, took some words on from a few guys a couple of years ago. Work smarter, not harder. How could we do this really simply? Now, some of you might go, I'll get my router plane out. Okay. So Craig's just saying chop saw. Conway's just going to don't make furniture as round components. So we could go router plane. That would be lovely, but we don't all have one of those. So we'll put it back on the shelf. We want to pair across this and get a nice flat surface. 
So, how about a piece of timber? Colwyn, what you got? Well, Morris was just asking, wouldn't it be easier to use a British saw? I'm guessing he means a push as opposed to a pull. Either will work. Um, that's kind of the reason I use both saws. Tomorrow I'm going to use both saws for you again when we do the halving joint because actually both will work. Um, Japanese saws can be easier to control. They're thinner section. They take less material weight, as in waistline, so you can cut a bit more accurate, but they are an art. They take a bit of getting used to. Western hand saw with something as a spine back, a bit more strength, maybe not as wide can be good, can be easier to rest against that square face that you create with your knife wall, easier to control. But I will tell you, I could talk to 100 different people, 50 might like the Japanese source, 50 might like a traditional tennis saw. depends on what they're using. So either saw will work. My best advice on saws is pick up something if you can, have a play with it. The shops are back open now, so you can go and have a wander around. If you can, pick a saw up, have a go with it. How does it feel? Does it feel comfortable in your hands? Don't go too coarse. Um, so the Veritas saw that I've just picked up, I looked at these yesterday. We've got three or four in here. This is cross-cut. We're cross-cutting across the grade. This is 16 TPI. It's relatively fine. What does that mean? It's going to take me a little bit longer to do the cut, it will produce a finer finish, doesn't need forcing. And it's amazing when we watch people when we do courses and stuff where they're there and they're like, both hands and they're trying to push this. One hand, the idea of having the spine on the back adds that weight to help it drop. So my best advice on your saw thing, pick up something you're comfortable with using. You can use whatever, all right? But get familiar with how it cuts. Don't force it, give it time to clear. So hopefully that sorts that one out. Now, on here then, we've got our piece of wood. Let's just recap for you where we are. We've got our knife line edge, the KN. We've got a level of fibers across here, not right down to there. I can put that back in, clamp it back up. We've got that pine board on the back here as our break board to stop anything splintering out. I've been and got a piece of plywood and I set this up yesterday. I put some abrasive on the bottom. That can go on here in behind. So that's there. Craig, can you go to four? So there's our boot. A bit of ply, a bit of abrasive. Why the abrasive underneath? It stops it sliding. I've set it up and worked out my height I already want. This now gives me a pairing board. Now, to start with, I can drop the handle down. We can work back across. Again, not trying to go all the way across the board. Nearly to where I want to be there. Slice it. Chisel action's changing now. I'm using it more like a knife. The whole time I'm pushing down my fingertips on the bit of plywood, give you something as a bearing surface and help you get something nice and accurate. Going about halfway, just checking we're getting right up to there. Take it out. Blow the waist off, turn it over. Do it back up. This side, do the same. So the handle, again, is going down towards the floor. I've got a ply board in the front. So first few cuts are just taking the high spots back off. Now the joy of working this way I know I'm getting down to my scribe line. I've got that bit of plywood as that last stage. So gently push through. Fingertips are pushing down on the plywood with the left hand. Now we knew I went a bit deep that Japanese saw. I said it cut rapidly. Now look at this chisel action, beautiful now to get across there and know that that's nice and flat. So we've got the flat of the chisel on the back. As she goes across, gives you something a lot more controllable. So we've got nice square shoulder there, equal thickness. I'm hoping we can see from there. We'll hold that on the piece of wood a minute. Now back to the other end then. Got to square that up. We're not quite back to our scribe line. Actually, if we put that together as a joint, I'm just trying to think the best way to try to show you. 
that would show it. That little bit of dirt, that black I've got on this corner now. Just see the line. So, got to get in there. Now, everyone's doing that a couple of ways. Might even go back to doing what we've just done. But really down the other end. But this is harder to do now because I've got to find my point there. This end, not a lot to remove, but I've got to try and square this up. If I'd done this to start with, it would be easier. Other way, which I've used quite a lot, I put this on the bench. I've got room. Line it up. Just seeing where we are with our scribe line. I want to get that shoulder nice and square. It takes a bit of effort. I much prefer doing my knife line. <laughs> See what we've got as a longer camp. Not going to quite. Okay. All right. We'll go freehand. We'll do a Melvin then. Sorry, Craig. So we've got a scribe line. This will give you the old fashioned way. Now, if I was going to be nice and accurate at this, I would probably clamp a piece of wood across it like I was trying to get back in there. I've got to cut this. Now, this takes quite a bit of effort. I'm also trying to get it nice and square. Can't do all of it in one go. Using wide chisel, 25 mil wide. Why? Gives me the bearing surface to position and hold on to what I've already done. So try and produce a straight edge. But that's actually quite hard work. Pushing that in, get that nice square corner. We'll go back to our piece of wood here. Now we want to get a square edge. Right, let's just have a look up on there. Now, I've got, but it's so difficult to pick up on the cameras here. This is the joint we did freehand. I've got a small gap in here. From looking down, I don't think my shoulder line on the square face is quite square. So in other words, where I've just done that chisel cut, it's actually angling towards the end, very slightly. So it's actually angling in the direction my pencil goes in. So I need to undercut it a little bit more. Possibly putting the voice, chisel across it. I need to get it back. Now, if you're doing a proper tenon and you're doing this all the way around, things can get longer. You've done this side, you get that square, you put it into your joint, you do the other side, and you suddenly realise they don't line up. And I know this when we've done table courses and stuff with guys, that trying to get this spot on is hard work. This side, our knife line, we used that nice knife line before we started. Get back into there. That matches like a glove. It's square, nice and accurate, so easy to do. So in reality, that knife line aspect of using your square to create that's a pattern. So you have your square. You have your marking knife, everything nice and square from there, and you draw it across four or five times and chisel down to create a nice V. So much easier. So bear with us. Just want to get this out. Then we're going to look at that saw that we said about where we're on about which saw to use. Because hoping this will help demonstrate why this is quite an important little tip to use. So just working back across. I can break some of those fibers off my fingertip, want to get right back into the corner. So again, I can use the knife, draw it up, get comfortable where I hold it, get it nice and square so not trying to tilt too much. Pull it across. Clean the waist out. Good there. Now to give you the idea of what I need to do with my saw, now we've got that V, I can bring it up to there. Do that. Okay, now 
Craig, I don't know if you're over. Where are you? Over, can you go overall shot? Front shot, number one. Okay. Yes. This hand. This doesn't even need to be in place. I don't need to steady it. I'm using that little wall just to do that. So that simple knife line idea really does help. Gives you a way of actually creating a bright line, a square shoulder, and make it more accurate. It's so difficult if you're new to this and you're picking up a handsaw and you want to cut something dead on that shoulder. Can you see it clearly? Get your glasses on. Get your marking gauge. Now, a cutting gauge will give you a nice, good line. We already said we can slide up, do that bit. Amazing how just doing that little bit of chiseling new, it's not a lot of work, creates a good break line. Colwyn, what you got? So Vicky's just asking, is there a set of Japanese saws that you could recommend as there's so many to choose from? Look at what you want to use the saw for, okay? It is something we're going to look at. We've been asked about, can we do something on Japanese saws? Because, oh, my God. What's, which one? Um, do they both do the same thing? No, they have different tasks. So the descriptions that we tend to put within the catalog or on the web will give you a really good idea of what to go with. Look at the length. Small ones, some of these have a back. So this one, if you take it out, oh, undo the screw. These have an interchangeable blade. Very thin blade section. Great for things like dovetails with it having a back. Really good for doing the dovetails because it helps strengthen it. Get that one back in. If you're doing something as a rip cut, you want something bigger. But get that one tightened up. So again, this is bigger, but as a back saw, this will actually give you a thinner cut for dovetails, tenons. So sorry, Craig. All right. On there, so that will give you a cut for there. So again, we've got our back. So if you're doing something like we're doing now, something with a back on it's going to be so much better. It's going to give you the stiffness. If you want to rip cut something, and if you look at the difference on this, these are in reality the same size type of saw, but this doesn't have a back all the way down. So this will allow you to rip down through the board. Long cuts, but easy. How many teeth it has will give you an idea, and you can start looking. I think we give you a description of that from memory. How many teeth it has, the more teeth per inch, the finer it is. It will give you a finer cut, might take a little bit more effort, a little bit more time. That's the magic word maybe there. Give you that control. Coarse tooth saws can be difficult to start. Um, one of the things I can vividly remember is cutting my left thumb with... A Japanese saw because it was coarse trying to pull it towards me when I started. So we're just going to create another knife line just for another knife wall just on there. So just using that chisel. So any tenons I want to do, halving joints, anything like that. This little bit, so good. So I can slide my knife up, drop back into that groove. I can use the square to come back in behind, create our shoulder line. You can see with that long point of that Japanese knife, really good to get into there. Clean it out. Just want to go a bit bigger. Probably had enough room, really, but. Fingertips, my nails, just breaking off those fibres, getting out of the way. Knife I can bring back in, square against the shoulders. Bring the square back up, just going to sever those few fibres in the bottom. This ends really where I'm looking at. So your Japanese saw, this is quite coarse. Craig's got the quick camera shot, that's great. Now, again, I'm not even using my left hand. So that shoulder line that we've created makes that really controllable to do. But it's amazing. If I said to you, can you lay out a knife wall to run your saw against? Most of you go, a what? What's he on about? But it's a magic little tip. Create that little knife wall. So marking knife, chisel it back. Doesn't have to be a 45 degree angle. You can go as deep as you like. Set your saw up in it. With the angle, it will pull it down towards that face. Get your position, then start your saw cut. Real basic little tip. 
fantastic to use. Something as a pairing block to set your heights to can be really good. Double-sided tape and a little bit of a brazier stops it sliding along the bench. Really easy to do and gives you a set place to work down to. Doesn't make it difficult. Hopefully, now let's find out for the boys where we are. Craig, all right. Cohen, any more questions? Nothing there, mate? No. Okay. Hopefully you guys have explained it. Knew this was going to be a little bit of a short one. Tomorrow we're going to do halving joint. Uh, let's see if I can find. I put them away when we did the photo. So we're going to do halving joint, whether you into lock. Okay. So you can make cricket bats. I don't know what this is. Okay, so but we're going to do a halving joint. Working actually, and it's going to repeat some of the techniques we've done today. You're going to look at, but going to go for it a bit more, a bit quicker. Hope you've enjoyed today. So tomorrow, like I said, we've got the halving joint. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks very much. Bye then.